All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think we'll get started now. Um, I'm going to be talking about theory and history, and I'd like to recommend a book which I think is very good on theory and history, namely the book by von Mises called Theory and History. <laughs> it's quite appropriate for lecture on this subject. It's a, I remember uh, in 1969, uh, Hayek told me how much he admired the theory and history. It, of the four major books that uh, Mises wrote, the theory of money and credit in 1912, uh, socialism, 1922, human action, 1949, in theory and history, 1957. Probably theory and history is the least read of the books, but it's also the easiest one to read. So I would suggest if you find Mises a bit difficult, at least in his major works, theory and history might be a good one to uh, to look at first. Uh, incidentally, uh, for those of you who are planning to take the uh, oral exam, uh, the question, what are Mises' four most important major works has sometimes been asked on the final, so it might be good to take note of that. Uh, now, in considering uh, history, uh, there are two different meanings. We can talk about the theory or philosophy of history. This can designate uh, two different sorts of inquiry that correspond to two meanings of the word history, the concept history. By history, we can mean the events that have happened at a particular time in the past. For example, we can talk about the history of the Roman Republic or the history of the US Civil War and so on. So we're referring to particular events that have happened, but we can also use the word history to mean the writing of history. So we could talk about the history of writing on, of historians who've written on the uh, on the fall of the Roman Republic or the causes of the US Civil War. So we'd have this distinction then between the events and writing about the events. Both could be called history. Sometimes the writing about the events is called historiography rather than history. We could, we could have a history of historical writing, the history of the history of history. That was actually a book uh, under that, the history of historical writing was a book by uh, the historian sociologist Harry Elmer Barnes, had a book with just that title. Uh, he's a quite controversial figure. He and Murray Rothbard were, uh, were very good friends. Uh, uh, if you'll permit me a digression, it's uh, all right for an old man like me. Uh, during the uh, 1960, just before 1964 presidential election, I was in high school, and I called up Harry Elmer Barnes, who was at that time uh, fairly old, and I asked him who he favored in the 64 election. He said, uh, as my old friend Henry Mencken once said, I think I'll sit this one out. But as I say, there are these two meanings of history, the actual events that have transpired at a particular time and writing about them. And corresponding to that, we can distinguish two meanings of philosophy of history. Uh, one would be the view that the events, all the events in the history of the world fall into a pattern. There's some sort of explanation or for all the events or some sort of 
general pattern for all the events in history. So there is a story of world history. History has a meaning. Hegel was the most famous writer uh, to hold this view in lectures on the philosophy of history. And then we, there's another meaning of philosophy of, of history where we'd be studying the problems and nature of historical inquiry. So we'd be concerned with the, the second meaning of history, of the writing of history. We'd say, what is involved when the historian is writing history? What are some of the philosophical problems involved? What are some of the issues the historian has to deal with? And most of this lecture will be devoted to uh, philosophy of history in this sense, in, in what the historian is the problems facing the historian rather than the problems of a philosophy of history in the other sense, namely a general pattern. Although, depending on how much time uh, this takes, we could get to the, this other meaning also. Uh, now, one way in which the historian, uh, where we can u apply theory to history, where is which would be particularly concerned to us in this course is the application of praxeology to history. So uh, praxeology is, you'll remember from uh, earlier lectures, is a, a science of human action. So in praxeology, we're not concerned with particular events, say we have in praxeology, we have the uh, the uh, statement that each person chooses his most highly valued preference. That doesn't tell us what the person's preferences are. We know that's uh, general truth. But even though praxeology isn't doesn't tell us about particular events, we can apply praxeology or use praxeology to help us explain uh, particular events. For example, uh, suppose a historian is trying to explain uh, America's Great Depression, uh, as Murray Rothbard did in his book of that, uh, that title, which came out in 1963. So in Rothbard, both in his explanation and his selection of facts to explain, He's influenced by part of praxeology, namely the Austrian business cycle theory. So what he stresses is the policy of the Fed in the 1920s, which he considers expansionary. And as because he's guided by Austrian theory, he looks for things that other historians who were not guided by Austrian theory would omit. For, for example, prices in the 1920s were not going up very much, but Rothbard, since he holds the view that uh, depression is generated by an expansionary credit boom, will a asks uh, what would prices have been had the Fed not pursued this expansionary policy? And this is a question that someone with a different theory would probably not raise. So we can see how uh, Rothbard, in this case, was guided by the, uh, by the Austrian business cycle theory, by this part of praxeology. And we could compare this uh, with, say, Mil the book by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz on uh, called the Monetary History of the United States, which came out in the same year as Rothbard's book, 1963. In their view, the Depression was not caused by an expansion expansionary Fed policy in the 1920s. 
They have the view that the Depression came about because the Fed unwisely contracted the money supply just around the time uh, the Depression struck in October 1929. So because they're guided by a different theory, they're looking for other facts, and the, the way they explain the facts is guided by a completely different account. So, uh, well, of course, I think the Austrian view is the correct one. It isn't my purpose here to go into the merits and demerits of Rothbard and Friedman, except to say, of course, that Rothbard's entirely right and Friedman <laughs> wrong. Rather, I just want to make the point that the historian, in this case, economic historian, is guided by the theory that he holds. Uh, we can see another example of this in the brief but very illuminating uh, remarks that Mises makes in Human Action on the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, I think in the scholar's edition, this is around page 762, he deals with this very briefly. And as you know, there are all sorts of theories on the fall of the Roman Empire. For example, that of Edward Gibbon, who blamed the rise of Christianity for weakening the Roman Empire. Remember his famous sense, they themselves decreed their fall. And then there are other theories. There was one, the lead poisoning theory of the fall, the Roman Empire, that claimed that uh, there was lead that had gotten into the drinking supplies of the people in Rome, and this had a bad effect on uh, their mental capacity, so that, and it, uh, that was uh, actually a theory of a, a sociologist, S. Colm Gilfillan, who was a quite interesting person. I met him uh, years ago. He was, uh, so, uh, wrote on sociology of invention, but the theory that Mises gives a brief account, again, where he shows he's applying economic theory to help explain the fall the Roman Empire, he says that because of economic regulations such as price controls that had been imposed, uh, trade became much less than it had been in previous times, and the economy tended to break up into there were several se separate estates, a lot of fundias, and they became isolated from the rest of, the, from the uh, commerce, and in this way the empire was weakened. It was much, uh, so this permitted it, the overthrow of the, of the empire by the, by the various barbarian tribes. So we, uh, here Mises was relying on the, on the work uh, of the great uh, Russian historian Michael Rostovtsev, who uh, ca came to the U.S. He was ag against the Bolshevik government. He came to the U.S. and he taught in, in America. But he had a great book, The Social and Economic History of the Roman Empire, and he, he gives this account. So once again, we see the importance of theory in trying to understand history. And I'll give one other illustration, although I didn't put it on the, on the slides, is that, say, one's trying to ac uh, account for the standard of living in the, in, after the Industrial Revolution, say, in England after 1760. Uh, there's a group of Marxist historians or left-wing historians will say uh, that con they will stress conditions in factories at the time of the Industrial Revolution were extremely bad. There was a lot of child labor. People had to work extremely long hours under very harsh conditions. But Mises asked a question. Again, he's relying on his knowledge of economic theory. Uh, 
what would have happened without the Industrial Revolution. He points out there was a great increase in population in Britain in the 18th century. So if there had not been an Industrial Revolution, the increased population couldn't have been supported at all. Uh, people would have just died out the actual conditions in the Industrial Revolution, even though they're bad by contemporary standards, are quite were an improvement for a great number of people at the time. So here again, we see that because of his knowledge of economic theory, Mises is asking, able to ask the counterfactual question, what would have happened in the absence of the Industrial Revolution? And uh, historians who don't have that knowledge would probably not ask that question. Uh, one book, incidentally, I would recommend if you're interested in the uh, Industrial Revolution standard of life is a book edited by uh, Hayek that came out in 1954 called Capitalism and the Historians. This has uh, essays by uh, T.S. Ashton, who was one of the great uh, British economic historians. I think Bertrand de Juvenel has an essay, and uh, W.H. Hutt has two very important essays. That's a very good book on this topic. Uh, I, I want to mention uh, another instance in which uh, the, one's uh, knowledge of economic theory affects historical interpretation. This I mentioned uh, briefly in my lecture earlier this morning for any of th those of you who were unfortunate enough to be at that lecture will recall this. Uh, according to the Marxists, uh, fascism is really a stage within capitalism. Uh, the Marxist view, say we find this in the book of 1933 by the British Communist Party writer R. Palm Dutt. He was actually, he was from India, but he spent most of his life in England, called Fascism and Social Revolution. What he says is that because of the capitalism find from Marxist theory faces economic collapse. There's depressions and there's some question how are the capitalists going to maintain power. So the way they do that according to Dutt and other communist theorists of the time was to get was to support a dictator who will ruthlessly, ruthlessly suppress proletarian revolution and keep the capitalist class in power. So in the view of this view, which we can also find in a more sophisticated form in the famous book, uh, Behemoth by Franz Neumann uh, on the Nazi economy. So in this view, Hitler was really a tool of the German monopoly capitalists. They thought that well, we've got to make sure we stay in power, so we have to suppress the left wing, the proletarian parties, especially the Communist Party, and make sure, even if it requires getting rid of civil liberties, the price is worth paying to maintain capitalism in power. But Mises rejects that view, as you can imagine, entirely rejects it. He says, no, in the Nazi economy, this was not at all dominated by the capitalists. In fact, in the Nazi economy, the government was in complete control because the government, even though private property was preserved in name, in name the government was telling the owners and the, uh, the corporate executives what prices to set, what wages to pay. So the, the private owners were really converted into government 
bureaucrats who simply had to carry out orders. And he says that this is a form of socialism, so it's not a form of capitalism at all. It isn't that the Nazis were in the were tools of the capitalists. It was rather the capitalists were required to do what the Nazis told them. So it's a form of socialism, not of capitalism. Uh, now, what I've given so far are instances in which the historian can use economic theory in order to guide him in interpreting the past, in understanding what happened, or in picking out which facts to stress or how to uh, understand what's happening. But Mises stresses that the historian is not only should be take account not only of praxeology, but of the existing state of science. So the historian's explanations should correspond to current scientific knowledge. And he gives what I think at any rate is a rather amusing example, although in past years when I've given this example, the audience doesn't tend to think it's so amusing, but after all, I'm giving the lecture, so it doesn't, doesn't <laughs> matter. Uh, well, what Mises says is, say we have a, say a historian who's trying to explain uh, witchcraft, say in Europe, in the uh, in the uh, 16th century and later, there were uh, outbreaks of uh, witchcraft hysteria in which the very if you pardon the pun, which various nations were having campaigns to arrest uh, alleged witches, and they were, many of them were tortured and killed. So Mises says, well, if a historian's trying to explain this. He won't say what was happening was that these women who were accused of being witches were really in communion with the devil and that the people who suppressed them were just acting defensively to get were to guard against this peril. He said, well, the historian today wouldn't say that because we no longer believe in that view. It's scientifically outmoded. We don't accept that. And what I, at any rate, thought was funny was that one of the leading 20th century historians of witchcraft was a man called Montague Summers. He was a, a British writer. He claimed to be an Anglican priest, but there's actually some doubt whether he was one. So he held just the theory that Mises said no, 20th century historian would hold, and he actually did hold that. But I think Mises wouldn't be phased by that. He would just say uh, that uh, Summers was taking the wrong view of that, and even if he did, he shouldn't have held that view. Now, when I, I gave examples that how the historian can use praxeology to help explain particular events. But one limit to using praxeology is that the historian cannot deduce particular facts from, uh, from praxeology. We have praxeology, as I mentioned before, gives a general knowledge of facts that it says we always choose our most highly valued preferences, but it doesn't tell you what at particular times people will choose or won't choose. Uh, for example, in Austrian business cycle theory, uh, it will say, the Austrian business cycle theory, we know if bank credit expansion takes place and the money rate of interest uh, will falls below the natural rate of interest, which is largely determined by the rate of time preference, then 
there will be malinvestment will take place. But we can't deduce from praxeology that such an expansion will take place. We have a conditional statement. If there is expansion, such and such is likely to happen. But this doesn't tell us that the expansion will take place. That's something that we could only determine by empirical investigation. Uh, so here, uh, remember in that uh, my first lecture, uh, I would mention that Mises was a very strong believer in a priori truth. He thought that there were certain propositions, certain judgments we could make just that we know would be true just by thinking about them. And his opponents, the one, some of his opponents, the logical positivists, said, no, no, there aren't a priori statements that actually give you knowledge about the world. A priori uh, true statements are all tautologies that are just explaining how people have chosen to use words. So although Mises and the logical positivists were sharply at odds, here he agreed, he said, he didn't think that you could deduce particular events in history. So he said, if you want to know what's happened, you can't tell that just by thinking about it. There, you have to engage in actual uh, investigation of what happened. But in doing that, praxeology will help you uh, in understand what, what's happened. We now could raise this problem. Supposing it certainly seems right that praxeology doesn't enable you to deduce particular events. We can't say deduce praxeologically that uh, Britain declared war on Germany on September 3rd, uh, 1939. But does it follow that because prax we can't deduce particular events from praxeology, that there are no laws of history? It would seem like there is a step missing there because maybe there are other laws of history other than praxeological laws. Maybe as we've given it so far, we have praxeology on one hand and then the facts, but maybe there's some other kind of laws and we can use those to help us say that particular events have happened. So those kind of laws wouldn't be a priori laws, they would be inductive generalizations. And uh, Mises rejected that, he said, if there, are if there are laws that apply to history, the only relevant ones are praxeological laws. Uh, there aren't other kinds of laws that might apply to history. And he said the reason for that is that there are no constants in human action that are quantitative. So there would be nothing equivalent to a historical law of gravitation. Okay, and the law of gravitation it's empirical in that we have to investigate what the gravitational constant is, but there's nothing like that in history. There aren't inductive generalizations. And what the historian is faced with is people, historical actors, who are freely deciding what to do. And he, take, he calls human free choice an ultimate given, which means the historian or uh, anyone else can't go beyond the free choice and ask what determined the choice. We just have to accept choices and then try to account for them. But we can't have a causal theory explaining these choices. Now, if, if there are no general laws that uh, account for individual facts. This, of course, raises the problem. How can the historian try to explain uh, these individual facts? There's uh, 
uh, if we can't, don't have any laws, historical laws, can we do anything more than register facts or make a chronicle of these facts? And Mises said, yes, because there's something else. There's another way to explain events other than uh, by appeal to historical laws. And this is what he calls specific understanding, or he very often will use the German word verstehen for this way of explaining events. And what is involved in this is trying, instead of trying to explain an event by subsuming it under a general law, we try to grasp the law in its particularity. We try to grasp the individuality of the, of the event by kind of sympathetic understanding of it. So we're not trying to put it under any general law, we're grasping it in its individuality. Now, that sounds like a difficult task. How do we do that? Uh, and what the way he suggests we proceed is that, say we have a certain action, someone has done something, we, try, we would ask what judgments and beliefs about the world combined with what desires someone might have would explain that person's action. So we're imputing some set of beliefs and desires to someone who say something like, well, if I had these beliefs about the world and desires, I would do such and such. And we try to come up with a set of belief and desires, beliefs and desires that would account for what the historical actor has done. And in doing that, we're making judgments about of relevance of various factors that might have affected someone's judgment. We're saying what particular uh, items, things that have happened might have influenced that, that actor what that would help account for the beliefs and desires that led to the action he took. Uh, for example, uh, supposing a historian is trying to explain uh, Abraham Lincoln's policy in 18, March 1861 after he took office, and Lincoln was faced by various states in the southern states had seceded from the Union, and then uh, there was a question, uh, should Fort Sumter, it was, which was the uh, uh, Union for American Fort, which was helped collect the tariffs into the port of Charleston, had been blockaded by the Confederate Navy. So Lincoln had the question, uh, should he try to uh, break the blockade? Should he send reinforcements? So if a historian is trying to explain Lincoln's policies, what he would do would be attribute certain beliefs to him, uh, for example, and desires, for example, that Lincoln didn't accept secession. He wanted to keep the Union in being and he thought that if he sent uh, troops to relieve the fort and they were fired on, he had the belief that this would there be a, an outswelling of popular support for putting down the southern, the southern uh, rebellion against the Union. So if you impute those beliefs and desires to Lincoln, then you can understand how he uh, arrived at the policy he did. So this is what an example of what Mises meant by specific understanding of Rishte. And we're saying, if the acts say, imagine that I'm Lincoln, if I had these beliefs and desires, I would have sent the troops to relieve Fort Sumter. So if you can, if that, if you find that explanation plausible, that would be a case where this 
specific under, method of specific understanding works. Uh, now, one mistake that people make about specific understanding of Rishtayin is that they, it doesn't imply if you're, if, say, the historian's trying to understand the beliefs and desires of historical act, or trying, as it were, to get into the mind of historical act. It doesn't imply that you sympathize with the historical act, or that because you're trying to figure out what would account for what he did, that you yourself come to identify with that person. And uh, surprisingly, the great philosopher, American philosopher Saul Kripke, who is perhaps the leading philosopher in the world today, in the opinion of many people, seems to have made this mistake. He said, uh, he was commenting on a book by the historian David Irving called Hitler's War, in which uh, Irving had tried to explain the World War II from Hitler's point of view. So Kripke said, there's a danger if you apply this method that you'll become sympathetic to the subject just as Irving is quite sympathetic to Hitler. But even though that's true, I think it's probably true in this instance, it's not involved in the method. The method doesn't imply, uh, for Stein, doesn't imply sympathy for the uh, historical actor. In this connection, when we're trying to explain the value judgments the historical actors hold, this isn't suggest. This doesn't imply that either that this we ourselves as historians either approve or disapprove of those value judgments. If you say that someone had certain value judgments and use that to try to explain what they did, uh, that's a descriptive statement. It's not a value judgment of your own. It's saying that they had certain value judgments. Uh, now, another mistake that people make is they say, well, uh, supposing the historian is trying to account for the historical actors by considering his beliefs and desires in the way I've tried to explain. Doesn't that imply taking what the historical actor thought or believed at face value? Uh, but this isn't true at all. We can, the historian in doing that can compare the beliefs that someone had with the facts at the time as best he can determine them. So it doesn't, when you're trying to understand the actor's point of view, it doesn't at all imply that you're limited to that point of view. And there is a particular, I wanted to call attention to an important essay by Mises called uh, The Treatment of Irrationality in the social sciences, where Mises considers a very famous book on uh, the by the uh, great uh, German medievalist Ernst Kantorowicz, who later taught at Berkeley after he went into exile after Hitler uh, took over in 1933. So Kantorowicz, in his book, according to Mises tended to accept at face value the symbolism of the Holy Roman Empire. And Mises thought that had been a mistake. So you see, here is a case where we see a kind of a counter instance to this objection. Well, if you're relying on Verstehen, then you're limited to the uh, values and beliefs of historical actor. Here, Mises was saying Kantorowicz, who was one of the greatest German medievalists, was had fallen into error just because he put too much weight on the on the uh, symbolism of the Holy Roman Empire. I should say that the book by Kantorowicz uh, on uh, the Emperor Frederick II uh, uh, was a very controversial one. It was a bestseller in 
Germany, and one of the admirers of the book was Hitler, he thought very highly of that book, but uh, Kantorowicz, uh, of course, uh, later didn't stop Kantorowicz from leaving Germany, even though Hitler had liked his book. Uh, now, in, uh, in his account of uh, Method of Verstehen, uh, Mises was influenced by the English uh, historian R.G. Collingwood, who was also in uh, addition to being a historian and philosopher, was, he was a historian of Roman Britain and a philosopher who was also a leading archaeologist. So what Collingwood said was uh, you, the historian should recollect the facts of the past actors. And Collingwood went further than Mises. He said, if you do this successfully, you, your, the historian himself, you yourself are having the identical thoughts of the historian. You yourself are having the same thoughts as the historian did. And by same, he didn't just mean that you're having, we could imagine something like we say, each of us is having the same thought, like each of us is thinking, I wish this lecture would end, so you're having the same thought. But he meant same in a stronger sense. It's the, the, the identical thought, not numerically identical. So it isn't that they're separate acts of thought of the historian and the actor that happen to have the same content. He thought you were have if you were successful in historical understanding, you were having the identical thought of the past historical actor. And there were other writers who wrote about this special way that uh, the historian gets knowledge. And this, these include uh, Wilhelm Windelbahn, uh, Wilhelm Diltai, Heinrich Rickert, and Benedetto Croce. I should mention also probably uh, Giovanni Gentile was another one who was very influential. He was especially influential on Collingwood. Uh, now, the last thing I'll cover is the positivist response to this. And uh, what the positivists say is, well, this method of Verstehen may be an interesting way to generate hypotheses. Say you can imagine you're Lincoln and trying to figure out why he would decide to reinforce the troop, the Ford at Fort, Su at Fort Sumter in March 1861, but all you can do, that doesn't tell you anything. That's just, uh, unless you can come up with general laws that are, can be tested, it's, complete, it's completely unscientific. All you've done is come up with a way of generating a hypothesis. And in response to that, Mises and those sympathetic to Verstehen would say, this is all that we have. We can't come up with anything else. And there aren't any general laws of history. So it's either this or nothing. And if you're the most famous statement of this view, of kind of positivist view, general laws in history was in an article by Carl Hempel that came out in 1942 called The Function of General Laws in History. And you can see, I, I think, if you read this article, he simply sets up a model of explanation, but he doesn't really argue that that's the correct way of understanding explanation. He just says, well, here's what explanation is. Take it or leave it. And Mises preferred to leave it because... He didn't think there were such historical laws. Uh, well, I think we're about out of time now, so thanks very much. <laughs>